Are you saying Kinyella took her test? Yes, she did. Oh, oh no, not no. No, this is Dr. Nature doing it. Oh. Actually, you know what I did? I did um, Maureen's Zibi Spider, the Zima cookbook. Mm -hmm. I gave that a gun to you. Oh, 
We have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much to the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which you ought to have done, and we have done those things which you ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spur thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind. In Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, the most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show thy grace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Well, I always seem to draw these sorts of readings from the Old Testament. I'll proceed forward. <clears throat> A reading from Ruth. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me I will do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we read uh, our psalm appointed for today, Psalm 127. 
we will read an antiphonally to the star. Unless the Lord builds the house, their labor is in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, in vain the watchman keeps his vigil. It is in vain that you rise so early and go to bed so late. In vain too that you eat the bread of toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Children are a he heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his gift. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, are the children of the sea. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. He shall not be put to shame when he contends with his enemies in the gate. A reading from Hebrews. Sorry, I have the wrong glasses on. But at least I can see. <coughs> Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own, for then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to hear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. The Lord be to you, Lord. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, 
all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. So we invite the children to join Marie in our Sunday school as we sing the hymn 574, Before Thy Throne, O God, We Kneel. of the living God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. So I wonder if you have ever had uh, the experience in your life of being surprised by your own generosity. <laughs> and in many ways, our readings uh, today is about that, how people are surprised by their own generosity. And the, the gospel and the uh, Old Testament lesson are stories about widows. And in our culture today, uh, to be a widow or a widower is often about simply, not simply, but with difficulty, living uh, the rest of your life without your partner, your life's companion. And, and if you're fortunate, you will have made arrangements before the demise of your partner to make sure that there's enough money for that person uh, to go on. But in biblical times, um, widows had a very different story. And, and women in particular uh, were extremely vulnerable, not only for economic hardship, but 
uh, to receive stigma, enormous stigma uh, from society. And, and property and finances were controlled by men. And even today, in most places in the world where there are much older traditions and cultures and religions, that is still the case, that women often do not have control of property. So when their husband dies, what happens is that the, the land will revert often to the husband's family. But the husband's family also has a responsibility to take care of the widow and the children. In the 1990s, I was going back and forward to Uganda, and, and here you had HIV ravishing the community. And it, and it was largely married couples that were impacted by HIV. And so what would happen is that the, the widow and the children were often cared for by the brother of the deceased person. Or in many cases, the, the parents had to take care of their grandchildren. And uh, so that is still, you know, that is the, the biblical view of widowhood is still the case in many, many places in the world today. And in you, places like Uganda, there's no social security system. And your children are your social security. So uh, your daughters provided dowries so that you could have income in your retirement, your old age. And your sons became the warriors who would give you protection and security. So that's the context in which uh, these widow stories in the Bible um, are being told today. And uh, Naomi, in the Old Testament reading, um, is facing all of these challenges. And not only the loss of economic uh, income, and but she lost... Uh, you know, societal approval. She was stigmatized. And she, this has worn her down. She's really a bitter old woman. And she doesn't, she doesn't have many options. She's living with a distant relative in a foreign land. She has lost her husband. She has lost her two sons. She has these wives of her two sons that she really doesn't want to be around. And she's in a foreign land. And so her options are extremely limited. And she comes up with this scheme, basically that, that Ruth will seduce this distant relative who is wealthy, he is a farmer, that, that Ruth will seduce him and they fall in love and they get married and they produce a child. And that child gives her, restores the social status that she needed, and the security, the money that she needed to, to survive. And it's interesting, um, it's, it's kind of the only kind of option. She's using everything she has, her creativity, her intelligence, the resources and relationships, to move forward out of this horrible situation that she found herself in. And it's interesting that um, she's you know shrewd and calculating and determined but her plan works. And out of that comes the ancestor of King David and the ancestor of Jesus. And it's interesting that Jesus, uh, observing this widow coming to the temple, um, connects again with the story of the widow. And she's not scheming, the, the Jesus widow isn't scheming, but she remains vulnerable and even religious leaders who are supposed to be the safety security net for people like her, they, he is critical of them because they're not looking out for her either. And uh, he talks about uh, the religious leaders, you know, I'm going around in long robes and I sit in, in place. He's talking about the clergy <laughs> and, and that we have a responsibility to provide that safety net, that the faith community has part of that responsibility to care for those who are stigmatized and outside, uh, outside society who feel victimized by the, what's going on in, in, in their lives. And I wonder, that widow that comes to the treasury and the temple to make her offering, what deal is she making with God? What deal? What is going on in her life that she is 
trying to figure out, and she's giving all she has to place her bet that God is somehow going to transform and change whatever world she's living in. And she brings her all to that. So what's her sacrifice really all about? And it's interesting that these widow stories, between them, you have this epistle to the Hebrews. And it's interesting that in the lectionary, why is that there? Because it's about the theological reflection on the role of Jesus as the great high priest. Interesting, we have this cross where Jesus is dressed as a priest on the cross. So it's a theological reflection of what his sacrifice and what his intercession between humanity and God is all about. And I, and I see these widows in the story actually being intercessors. It's a way to describe what it means to be an intercessor uh, between what seems two opposite poles and how we connect those opposites. From the reality of the pain and the stigma and the desolation into one's potential. That is the role of intercession. How do we get from here to here? And who are the people who stand in the place to connect those? Uh, so this idea in Hebrews is worth reflecting on in terms of looking at sacrifice, in looking at how we find ourselves in that place where we're connecting things that don't quite connect yet. And there's a long biblical history of, in, of intercession. You know, the, the story of uh, God is about to bring fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham says, oh God, come on, if there's 10 righteous people, surely you'd save the city. And gets, oh, okay, maybe 10. And then he goes down, if there's one righteous person, will you save the city? And God gives in. Moses is also the friend of God who intercedes, and the law becomes that bridge between God and his people. And that goes on right through the temple sacrificial system where the high priest stands in the holiest of holies, connecting humanity, praying. And that passes right down through the faith community, through Jesus, through the people who follow Jesus, who intercede. And what we're doing in church today is we're praying for the world. We're connecting the world. And I want us to think about um, that connection from what the, widow, the widows are doing and what we as a people of faith are doing. And we're really honored today to have our Indaba partners, to have rural and migrant ministries, and to have Trinity Wall Street, and to have... Uh, members of our outreach committee here at St. Peter's, and we've been in conversation now for several months about how, what does it mean to be a community of intercession in a world that seems bottomless in its problems, its issues. And, and even, you know, we bring what we can, our widow's might, to those problems. And how do we fix those problems? And Many of us just feel overwhelmed that we just don't have the resources uh, to be able to, to deal with that. It's, it's, it's sort of mind-boggling. There was a report um, I read this week, and it was on television about it. It was research about the, um, the, the, the mortality rate among white working-class men between the ages of 45 and 55 that we'd seen in the 70s and 80s that, that mortality was increasing, that our, our life, we were living longer. And what this report that's come out of Princeton and the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs is showing that the gains that we made in the 80s and 90s is now decreasing. And alcohol, substance abuse, the use of uh, prescription medicines, and suicide among working class men of this age is now on the increase. And it's affecting uh, urban communities, and it's affecting you know, small communities, cities like uh, Beacon and Kingston. It's affecting the people in the Bible Belt. 
And it's, it's, it's a kind of disturbing report because it's saying the economic changes that's going on in this country, the knock-on effect of that, that people who maybe their parents had a good life, they had good jobs, but when manufacturing moved away from these communities, people in their 40s and 50s now can't find work. And so they self-medicate, and then they check out. And this report is about despair. It's about despair in this country. And those of us in the faith community, we have a biblical imperative to be intercessors in that, in that world. And we know the statistics that this country is, is heading towards a place now where 90% of the wealth of America is owned by 20% of this country. And that's getting, that divide is getting deeper and deeper. So the people at the bottom have 11% of the wealth to move forward and to make lives for themselves. And those of us working rural and migrant ministries, Trinity Wall Street, the outreach community at St. Peter's, we're seeing the impact of that around the world, through the country, and locally. And, and we are intercessors. We're standing in the place. And for some people, that means we increase our food banks. We grow food. We heard yesterday, part of our Indaba conversation, um, that 35% of the children who attend school in Sharon are on school meal programs. A couple of weeks ago, we heard 800 families in, in the Dutchess County region were part of our food bank. So we are trying to figure out ways in our community how we can have an impact locally for people who are desperate. And then the, the other challenge is how do we use our influence in government, in boards of directors, looking at our stock portfolios to try and to bridge that gap. And that is a more difficult conversation uh, that we need to have. Um, I, a couple of weeks ago, I met the, uh, the chairman of uh, Union <coughs> Seminary, and he lives here in Pine Plains. He's, some of you know uh, Dick D D Donham. And they have just made a decision to divest from fossil fuels and invest in uh, sustainable energy, clean, sustainable energy, which is a very courageous thing to do. He went off and talked to people at Harvard so that we begin to use our resources uh, to bring about the kind of transformation that we want to see in our, in our society. So we are exploring uh, ways that we can do this, and I hope that people in St. Peter's can find ways to talk about that. Um, because ultimately, you know, food banks and growing food in gardens isn't going to change the system that we are observing. It's going to take much more intentional strategic decision making to bring what we have um, to bring about that kind of change that we need to do. Now, it's very difficult to talk about money um, but this story this morning is not really about money. It's more about the intention and the courage. How do we find a way within ourselves to move forward when all seems desperate and bleak? That's kind of what this story is about. And I want to end with kind of a personal story of how... Um, how <coughs> That process has been very much a part of my, of my life. And about three years ago, many of you know, I, I have half my life here at St. Peter's. The other half is with the St. Paul's Foundation. And we're doing a lot of work around the world on hu human rights and so on. So about three years ago, a coalition decided that um, the 80 countries where it is illegal to be LGBT, people are criminalized, which means that they are often the most poor, the most uh, stigmatized in their countries. 
we were going to bring representatives from those countries to the International AIDS Conference in Washington. There were two or three times more infection rates because people didn't have access to health care or they were afraid to go and get tested. And so uh, we started raising money. We raised about 50,000 from different partners. And USAID, our government aid uh, group, promised us 100,000. So we, we went out there, we looked for people who were both gay and straight, working in the field of AIDS and HIV, but also had a connection with the faith community, because that was a big piece of our work. And our plan was to bring you know, 70 people to Washington, and a lot of people were working on this, and four weeks before the conference, USAID told us that they had no money to give us. So here we were, we had made commitments to these people, and, and I had many, had a couple of sleepless nights, you could imagine. And the decision was, you know, do we just call it off? Do we just say, you know, we, we didn't have the support? But something told me that we had to do that. We had to step forward and bring as many people, and we ended up bringing 26 people to a very important meeting uh, we had an opportunity to speak in churches and mosques in Washington. We, we met with people in Congress, which was amazing. It was really important. We got into some of the most uh, religious conservative <coughs> members of Congress to talk about funding and HIV and so on. And um, some of those, one young man actually who couldn't make it, he couldn't get a visa, was murdered the following year in Cameroon, and one young man when he returned to Ethiopia uh, was tortured by his government, and he had to come back to the US where he now lives. But what was interesting is that cohort of people um, were incredibly important to bring together, to engage that process, and some of them are doing extraordinary work today. And all we could do was bring our widow's might to that issue. And it wasn't enough. But that's what I'm saying. It's not about the money. It's finding the courage and the intercession, the role of the intercessor, um, to make sure, how, however inadequate it may be, it's about showing up and doing what we can. And I believe that if we do that, that the transformation and the connection and the healing and the work of Jesus and the work of God uh, will uh, surprise us and will give us uh, light on the road. We may be surprised by our own faith and by our own generosity, that we are beggars simply showing other beggars where to find bread. Amen. So I invite you to stand and we say together the Apostles' Creed on page 53. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered by the conscious Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is <coughs> seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. Endue thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only thee have been saved. Lord, keep this nation under thy care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let thy way be known upon earth. Thy saving among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the whole of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And the colic for today. O God, whose blessed Son was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Grant us, we beseech thee, that having this hope we may purify ourselves even as he is pure, that when he shall appear again with power and great glory, we may be made like unto him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where with thee, O Father, and thee, O Holy Ghost, he liveth and reigneth, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. O God, who makest us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of thy Son, our Lord, grant us this day such blessing through our worship of thee, that the days to come may be spent in thy favor, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. O God, O Lord, who is our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that we, being ordered by thy governance, may do always what is righteous in thy sight, <coughs> through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And in our prayers today, we remember those who have asked us to pray for them. We give thanks for our Indaba partners and for our diocese, and we pray for your guidance and inspiration as we seek ways in which we intercede for this broken world that we are saving with your love. We remember all who are sick. We remember all who have departed this life. We remember especially Sheila Ewing, and we pray for her repose. We pray for her family. <coughs> And I invite your prayers, and we turn to page 387 as we pray the prayers of the people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light perpetual shine on them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May they also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. And we sum up our prayers in the general thanksgiving on page 58. O 
Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, to give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, the world and the and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. So again, welcome, uh, and I hope that you can join us. Uh, we're having a kind of coffee hour, but it's, it's going to kind of roll into brunch. Uh, so if you can stay for uh, lunch with us, it's our official parish picnic today, um, please do, and if you just want to have a cup of coffee, um, we, can, we can certainly uh, take care of that today. Um, we also wanted to announce the inquirers class. Some of us met this Friday uh, between 4 and 6 in the parish hall, we had a great conversation. We're going to be doing that every Friday between now and the end of the year, and uh, you're all welcome to, uh, to come and just uh, talk about your questions and uh, how we share our uh, faith together. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's really uh, the deadline for keynotes, our uh, magazine, Parish Magazine, is November 22nd. So, November 20th. 20th. We're flexible. Uh, we're flexible. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let um, Anne, Anne Lafarge, who's here as well, uh, let them know uh, that you'd like to write something for that. Um, on November 22nd, St. Cecilia's Day, we're having a uh, treat, we're having a, uh, to celebrate the gift of music, St. Cecilia, patron saint of music, uh, some singers from Bard will be here to sing a William Byrd Mass, so the language of the prayer book that we use will be set to music uh, on that day, so we're looking forward to that. And um, I just wanted also to say, um, in terms of Maybe invite, will our Endava partners stand up and we want to officially welcome you all to St. Peter's this morning. Thank you. Thank you. It's, been, um, it's been a great journey to learn about how you're doing ministry at Trinity Wall Street and rural migrant ministries we know very well, but how there is a commonality in terms of, of what that intercession role means in different contexts. So we look forward, uh, they're obviously going to be staying for lunch today, so you'll get a chance uh, to get to know them, and you get a, a chance to get to know St. Peter's, but we're really glad you're here to pray. And we have a very special treat today. Uh, Tavon Cooper is uh, a volunteer singer with uh, Cathedral of St. John the Divine, and he has the most amazing voice, and he wants to do our offertory uh, today as a gift uh, to St. Peter's. Uh, so walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. No! 
prayer books, uh, the red prayer book at page 838. And we're going to say the uh, Thanksgiving prayer for our national life together. Page 838. Almighty God, giver of all good things, we thank you for the natural majesty that you do give this land. They restore us, so we all destroy them. Heal us. We thank you for the great resources of this nation. They make us rich, so we all destroy them. Forgive us. We thank you for the men and women who make this country strong. They are models for us, so we all don't fall short of them. Inspire us. We thank you for the torch of liberty which is distributed in this land. It has drawn people from every nation, though we have all been hidden from its light. Enlighten us. We thank you for the faith we have inherited in the Holy Church of It sustains our life, though we have been faithless to anything in it. Renew us. Help us, O Lord, to finish the good work here begun. Strengthen our efforts to blot out ignorance and prejudice, and to abolish poverty and crime, and hasten the day when all our people, with many voices in one united chorus, for the Lord by your holy name. Amen. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of the love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, and remain with you always. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is hymn 57, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. <laughs>